While the deadly tug of war match continues around the bloody ravine throughout the afternoon, other Union troops are ranging on the flanks as far as the rivers. Earlier in the day, Hooker had sent Emory with the cavalry and horse artillery to the left to reconnoiter and occupy the ground between the Union left and the James River. Probing around the extreme Confederate right, the 3rd Pennsylvania Cavalry penetrates as far as Redoubt No. 1. When General Heintzelman arrives in the afternoon, he orders Emory down the Lees Mill Road to a crossroad that leads to the James River. There, the cavalrymen meet Lt. Miles D. McAllister, who had been scouting the area, and he guides them up another road and across a mill dam where they halt. Emory feels he is not strong enough to continue any further up this road, which leads to the rear of the Confederate right, so he calls for infantry support. About 4 p.m., three regiments that Heintzelman has detached from Kearney's division arrive, but they are too little too late. Thus, the Yankees miss their opportunity to cut off the rebel retreat at Williamsburg by penetrating the extreme Confederate right flank. However, on the extreme Union right flank, events are moving towards a climax. The drama had begun early that morning when 16 local contrabands, escaped slaves running to the Union lines, wander into the Union camps from the neighboring farms. Sumner questions them, and though the stories do not at all agree, they encourage the belief that some of the enemy's works on their left are not occupied as they had been the afternoon before. A captain of the engineers is detailed to make a reconnaissance and he learns from another former slave about the road over Cub Creek Dam near Redoubt No. 14. Sumner detaches Brigadier General Winfield Scott Hancock's 1st Brigade from Baldy Smith's 2nd Division and sends them with five infantry regiments and a battery of artillery to cross the dam. Smith authorizes Hancock to advance as far as he thinks advantageous, promising him reinforcements. The 5th Wisconsin, 49th Pennsylvania, 33rd New York, and the 6th and 7th Maine, along with Captain Charles C. Willard's Battery E, 1st New York Light Artillery, made up of 6 guns, marched towards the York River and up the dam within sight of the redoubt. Here, they meet Brigadier General Erasmus D. Keyes, commander of 4th Corps, making his own reconnaissance of the area, and he promises to send Hancock some cavalry support. Not certain that the earthworks are truly vacant, Hancock cautiously places his battery on the crest of an overlooking hill, deploys skirmishers to either side of the road, and sends the 5th Wisconsin and 6th Maine regiments in column of assault over the dam and into the redoubt. A young Federal cavalry officer, 1st Lieutenant George Armstrong Custer, instinctively searching for the most glory-soaked field, is the first man to take possession of the enemy deserted stronghold. Leaving a few troops to protect his rear, Hancock sends back for reinforcements and repeats the same deployment pattern to take quiet possession of the next redoubt. This is redoubt number 11, and from the crest before it, Hancock can plainly see a mile across the open field to Fort Magruder and the redoubts in between occupied by the rightful owners. He immediately sets up his artillery to either side and throws out skirmishers and flankers to prepare for an assault on the nearest Confederate redoubt as soon as the promised reinforcements arrive. But instead of the four regiments and one battery Smith had mentioned, only four guns rumble up, unlimber in front of the redoubt, and commence firing on Fort Magruder. This alerts Colonel Jenkins, still in command of the fort, to the Union threat on his left flank. Colonel John Bratton with the 6th South Carolina Infantry Regiment is immediately ordered to join the companies already occupying redoubts 9 and 10 and Fort Magruder's guns swing around to support him. The short engagement that follows decides nothing. Hancock hesitating to press without reinforcements, and Braddon losing his artillery support as it is diverted back to the main battle at the Bloody Ravine. Thus, the opposing commanders send out skirmishers through the surrounding woods and settle down to a glaring contest while sharpshooters practice their trade and Hancock's artillery continues to throw an occasional shell into Fort Magruder. The 5th Wisconsin forms to the right of the battery, partially screened by some farm buildings, and the 6th Maine and 49th Pennsylvania stand to the battery's left. The 7th Maine is designated to protect Hancock's right flank in the woods between them and Williamsburg, while the 49th Pennsylvania is also responsible for the less threatening woods on the redoubt's left. The bulk of the 33rd New York remains in the redoubt itself. 
By now, it is 2 p.m. Hancock again sends a staff officer back to headquarters, urging in stronger terms the importance of promptly reinforcing him. In reply, Sumner orders him to withdraw to the relative safety of Redoubt No. 14. Lieutenant Custer stands by, watching General Hancock grow increasingly more impatient and profane. Rather than comply, Hancock decides to send back yet another messenger and to wait until 4 o'clock. If no reply reaches me from headquarters, he confides in Custer, I will then withdraw. But when 4 p.m. arrives and still no reply to a fourth staff officer dispatched at a gallop, Hancock stalls another half hour, and then another. His entire brigade staff is in the rear trying to explain the importance of the position and the need for immediate help. Well aware that disobedience of Sumner's order could ruin his military career, Hancock is confident that in any minute the reinforcements will arrive. However, it is in vain hope on Hancock's part. Each time one of his urgent dispatches is sent into headquarters at the Whitaker House, Smith would turn to Sumner for permission to send in his 2nd Brigade under Brigadier General William T. H. Brooks. The first time, Sumner grants it, but then countermands the order just before Brooks gets underway, on the grounds that he wants to hold them in reserve for Hooker. When General Smith later renews his petition, Sumner flatly refuses, having already decided to order Hooker to retire. Finally, Sumner changes his mind and orders Smith to Hancock's aid, but he then again revokes the order after Brooks has marched halfway to the redoubts. Though Smith, as a subordinate officer, has no choice but to accept Sumner's judgment, others more loosely connected with the army are at liberty to express their opinions. One such observer is a Frenchman serving on Hooker's staff, Francois de Orléans, Prince of Jeanville, the third son of former King Louis Philippe I. Earlier in the day, the prince rode to Yorktown, where he reportedly told Major General McClellan, General, you have three old women in the advance presumably referring to Sumner, Heinzelman, and Keyes. Little Mac is busy supervising the transport of Brigadier General William B. Franklin's 1st Division of 1st Corps up the York River to West Point, Virginia, where he hopes to cut off the Confederate retreat before Richmond. McClellan has no time to come to Williamsburg to take command until the arrival of William Sprague IV, the governor of Rhode Island, who had attached himself to the Army of the Potomac to look after state troops. All day, Governor Sprague had watched and discussed as Sumner refused to support his generals, so he rode to Yorktown to impress upon McClellan that things were not going well on the front. Persuaded at last, General McClellan mounts his trusty warhorse Dan Webster, orders two divisions of Sumner's 2nd Corps to follow him, and take off at a gallop towards Williamsburg. The slushy road often forces them into the woods and brush, but McClellan's steed Dan Webster earning his nickname That Devil Dan covers the 12 miles in an hour, and they arrive at the Whitaker house shortly before 5 p.m. There, General McClellan finds everything, in his words, in a state of chaos and depression. The troops were weary and discouraged, but my presence at once restored their confidence. With the men's cheering still ringing in his ears, Little Mac calls a conference of his generals and orders Smith to support Hancock at last. Accordingly, General Brooks sets out once again, for the third time that day. Accompanying Brooks is the 1st Brigade of Silas Casey's 3rd Division, 4th Corps, led by Brigadier General Henry Morris Nagley, who had suffered throughout the day as much from the weather from Sumner's vacillation. He was camped all morning on the Yorktown Road, a few miles below the Whitaker House. In the early afternoon, General Nagley received a verbal order from Sumner to bring his brigade up to the house but he was then instructed to support Hooker. They ride back at headquarters, just as McClellan is reining in, and so off they march again, amidst the pelting rain, with the mud to their ankles, at a double quick step to support Hancock. Meanwhile, the Confederates have become more aware of the threat on their left flank. As D.H. Hill waits in a wheat field to the left of Fort Magruder with the bulk of his division, he and Brigadier General Jubal Anderson Early hear the intermittent rumbling of Union artillery through a screen of woods in front of them. But having recently arrived on the field, 
Neither Hill nor Early have any idea of the battery's exact position. Anxious to get into the fight, the two generals make a quick reconnaissance of the wood's edge. And while Hill goes off to ask Longstreet's permission to attack, Early forms his brigade line in the field. General Early's pet regiment, the 24th Virginia, is placed on the extreme left of the brigade line. To its right are two green regiments, the 38th Virginia and the 23rd North Carolina, and the veteran 5th North Carolina under Colonel Duncan K. McRae holds the extreme right position of Early's brigade. Brigadier General Gabriel J. Rains forms his brigade and some artillery behind Early's brigade to cover any possible retreat. With a vague gesture towards the woods, Early tells his men that they are to assault and capture a battery over there and instructs them to load their weapons and fix bayonets. Longstreet hesitates to grant Hill permission for the assault, since he believes it unnecessary so late in the battle and is afraid it might delay their movement towards Richmond. Apparently, Longstreet is as ignorant of the exact location of the battery as Hill and Early. Nobody thinks to consult Colonel Bratton, who has been keeping a close watch on the Union-held redoubt for the past two hours. Nevertheless, after conferring with General Johnston, who is then on the field, Longstreet orders Hill to go ahead with the attack, but to fill the enemy with caution. Returning to Early's brigade, D.H. Hill takes his place on the right of the 5th North Carolina, while Early leads his old regiment on the left. Hill gives a command to march forward, but Early is unable to hear it, and so does not get the Virginia regiments started until after the North Carolinians are in motion. After crossing the wheat field, they penetrate the woods, where miry ground, the dense and tangled underbrush, dripping wet in the large fallen timber, somewhat impair the line's movement. But the Confederates press on at a full half mile through the pine forest, down a hill, across a country road, and up another slope of woods. By this point, the formation has become hopelessly broken, and all communication between the regiments lost. Each regiment is now on its own. By shortly after 5 p.m., Brigadier General Hancock has still not received reinforcements or further word from Sumner or Baldy Smith. The action on the right of Fort Magruder has nearly ceased, so he finally decides to retire with the now drenching rain providing him cover. No sooner does Hancock send the order to his outlying regiments to pull back to the crest of the redoubt than he hears skirmishing to his right. In a movement, gray uniforms begin pouring out of the rainy woods. At first, Hancock believes it is Confederate cavalry, as the Union soldiers are unused to seeing mounted officers leading at the front. But the attackers are Brigadier General Early and the 24th Virginia, who had reached the edge of the woods first. Before them lies an open plain with Colonel Bratton's redoubts on the far right and Fort Magruder beyond them. To their left is Hancock's redoubt, and to their immediate front stands a cluster of farmhouses and the Union battery. With scarcely a pause, the 24th Virginia charges out of the woods, over a fence, and into the field towards the battery in the 5th Wisconsin, which instantly opens fire with a concentrated volley. General Early is hit in the shoulder, forcing him to retire on his wounded horse. In the face of this determined onslaught, General Hancock immediately orders the guns and all supporting regiments to withdraw to the crest of the redoubt. The 6th Maine, closest to the battery on its left, stops halfway to cover the 49th Pennsylvania, which coolly marches back to the crest at the parade step, faces front, and dresses its line. The guns from Captain Willard's Battery E, 1st New York Light Artillery, limber up and fall back as quickly as the thick mud will allow. The 5th Wisconsin, which has formed square to repel an assault, now slowly retreats in line of battle, turning and firing at each step. Another wave of gray clad troops suddenly rise in the distance as the 5th North Carolina debouches from the woods. Hill had halted it at a stream in the woods to reform the line, but before he could find the regiments to his left, he heard shouting and firing it immediately to his front, 
in a voice which he took to be General Early's, above all the uproar crying, follow me. In response to this, he sends Colonel McRae with the 5th North Carolina Ford into the field, where instead of a Union battery they find Colonel Bratton's redoubts filled with perplexed South Carolinians. Because the Union positions out of sight behind a spur of woods, some confused companies charge into these works, much to Colonel Bratton's consternation. McRae marches his men forward until they can see the enemy battery, where suddenly they realize they are alone. The 23rd North Carolina and 38th Virginia, which should be filling the field to their left between them and the 24th Virginia, are nowhere to be seen. McRae begins to doubt he is in the right place, so he dispatches an aide to General Hill asking which battery he is supposed to attack. Hill sends back word to McRae to charge the battery which has opened on us and do it quickly. Immediately, Colonel McRae left Obliques' regiment and marches it several hundred yards through a soft and lumpy open field under constant artillery fire. Three color bears for the 5th North Carolina fall dead or wounded before a fourth man has the flagstaff shivered to pieces in his hands. One of General Early's aides frantically waves on the 5th North Carolina as it struggles through the mud and withering fire. For the 24th Virginia is also suffering terribly losing most of its officers and nearly a third of its men. By the time Colonel McRae reaches the Virginians, he and the Major the 24th are the only field officers still mounted on horseback. In the midst of this resolute charge by the Early's Brigade, Brigadier General Hancock manages to gather most of his men into a second battle line. The guns unlimber in the rear, halfway to the dam, and each company of Hancock's brigade fights its way back to the redoubt. Hancock forms a brigade along the fortification's rim and flank. All the men are assembled around the redoubt just as the 24th Virginia comes under the crest within 30 paces of the Union line and the 5th North Carolina has taken cover behind a split rail fence to the Virginian's right flank within 100 yards of the redoubt. At that moment, Major General Hill's orders to retire reaches both Confederate regiments, and Hancock simultaneously orders a fixed bayonet charge down the slope. Hancock noted, a few of the leading spirits of the enemy were bayoneted. The 24th Virginia angles to its left and disappears into the nearby misty woods. The North Carolinians, being too far from the woods, are exposed to the deadly Union volleys and the retreat back across the field. As the 5th North Carolina falls back, they leave their tattered battle flag and nearly three-fourths of their men behind. General Hancock, still reluctant to press the attack without further reinforcements, halts his brigade's charge at the foot of the slope and observes that the plunging fire from the redoubt, the direct fire from the right, and the oblique fire from the left were so destructive that after it had been ordered to cease fire and the smoke arose, it seemed that no man had left the ground unhurt who had advanced within 500 yards of our line. The entire charge and countercharge has only taken about 33 minutes. Meanwhile, Major General Hill goes off through the woods in search of his lost regiments from Early's Brigade. He finds the 38th Virginia huddled up in confusion, and the 23rd North Carolina is idly milling behind a rail fence. These regiments he orders to form to the left and sweep the woods for Yankees. Some flankers of the 33rd New York having penetrated the position. However, Hill finds that these men now under his personal command are poorly drilled and do not execute what he deems a simple maneuver, efficiently enough to please the general. Colonel Bratton, who had begged General Early for a place in the charge, is having trouble forming his 6th South Carolina, and Hill's best efforts are unable to move the South Carolinians up in time to support the engaged regiments. Contrary to Hill's orders, the 38th Virginia emerges from the woods and joins the 6th South Carolina on the slow march towards the battlefront. The 23rd North Carolina simply halts in the woods, further infuriating General Hill. Both Colonel McRae and Brigadier General Early are certain that the assault would have been successful had they been reinforced by these stray regiments. Brigadier General Hancock has similar complaints. No sooner has the last shot of the battle been fired when Baldy Smith arrives on the field, followed by Brooks, Nagley, and two other regiments. Together, these men of the 2nd Division encamp for the night around the saturated redoubts 11 and 14. The Battle of Williamsburg, or Battle of Fort Magruder, finally ends with the onset of nightfall. 
The engagement around Williamsburg has ended in a tactical stalemate. The Union is unable to exploit the flank attack by Hancock, which McClellan had called superb, and Longstreet's command begins withdrawn from their fortifications overnight. Meanwhile, the last men of Brigadier General Kearney's 3rd Division and 3rd Corps begin settling into camp before Williamsburg as the rain starts to subside for the evening. The next morning, May 6, finds the rainstorms departing to the east and the Confederates under Longstreet and Johnston. Some men occupied by wives and families depart to the northwest up the Virginia Peninsula towards Richmond. With Williamsburg abandoned, the Federals move in to occupy the town. Casualties for the Battle of Williamsburg, the first pitched battle of the Peninsula Campaign, include 2,283 Union losses and 1,682 Confederate killed, wounded, captured, or missing during the May 5th engagement. Longstreet's rearguard action at Williamsburg has succeeded in buying time for the Confederates to continue the withdrawal to Richmond and its outlying fortifications. McClellan would set up a supply base in Williamsburg, as he had done at Yorktown, and continue the pursuit of Johnston's army up the peninsula. The first battle may be over, but the campaign for Richmond has only just begun.